Welcome, my name is Emlyn Stam, Artistic Director of the New European Ensemble. And today I'm going to be talking with conductor Jonathan Berman, a good friend of ours, a conductor we've worked with often, and we're going to discuss the life, career, works, and personality of the wonderful British composer, conductor, all-around musician, Oliver Nussen. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Very nice to be here. So first of all, how did you meet Oliver Nussen? Well, I met him first when I was a teenager, about 13 or 14. My aunt uh, had known Ollie in college. They'd studied together. And I just started conducting, and she set up for me to go to a rehearsal. So I turned up uh, to the Amadeus Centre in London. It was London Sinfonietta, Ollie conducting, all Maxwell Davies. Turned up, went in, shook the hand of the great guy, said, thank you so much. And sat there for the whole rehearsal and followed the score and loved it. It was wonderful. Um, and then just as I was leaving, I went up and said, you know, thank you so much, Ollie. Um, and at this you just point, called him Ollie. You didn't say Mr. Nussen or something? Mr. Nussen. No, probably Sir or Maestro, right. which, you know, a frown came upon his face. Um, but as I was saying thank you, he noticed in my jacket pocket I had a book. And he asked me, so what are you reading? With that sort of glint in the eye that he had, like, almost a challenge. Um, and it was Evelyn Wars, The Loved One. And I then spoke about this for about four minutes, sort of forgetting where I was and getting really excited about The Loved One's all about a pet cemetery and a, and a, a person cemetery and it sort of draws comparisons between the plasticity of L.A. and the dead. And anyway, I ranted on about this for about four or five minutes. And Ollie sort of smiled. And all he said at the end of that was, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and that was, that was him through and through. When he, when he liked something or he, he got excited by something or interested in something, suddenly the doors were opened and his generosity and his warmth came through. Um, and so after that, I, I went back the next day, and the rest is history. Um, rather amusingly, to, to go to the end of his life, um, for his funeral, I, for whatever reason, didn't drive. I took the bus, and the bus dropped me off in the wrong place, and I walked across a field and ended up at a pet cremation centre <laughs> <laughs> and had to walk all the way around to get to his funeral. So I think he was, you know, smiling at that point. He would have enjoyed that. <laughs> Certainly. So tell us about your favorite, your favorite pieces by Oli. Well, most of them are my favorite. Um, and what's extraordinary about him is that all of the pieces are immediately recognizable as Oli. But they are often quite different in, in style or in substance. So you have a set of pieces uh, Hums and Songs of Winnie the Pooh, uh, Higgledy Piggledy Pop, uh, Where the Wild Things Are, which are really sort of fantastical, fun, humorous pieces. Um, I love, I mean, I love the two operas, and I've been lucky enough to work on them before. Uh, Higgledy, which is much less done than Wild Things, I think is extraordinary. And it's almost a whole sort of melting pot of almost pastiches. There are some moments where they're real pastiche, like there's a, a fake Mozart overture at the end of the opera. Uh, Jenny, the protagonist, who is a dog, who goes on a quest. Uh, and she, at the end of the quest, she gets to perform every day in an opera. And Ollie writes this immaculate, extraordinary little Mozart overture. Also, earlier in the piece, he was very proud. There's a moment where a baby's going to sleep, and he writes these two... Um, the idea is that there's a mobile going above the baby's head with uh, a wind-up mobile. And he writes these two uh, Mozartian numbers. Actually, they are directly copied. But he loves that there's one which sounds like Tchaikovsky by Mozart, and there's one which sounds like Mozart by Tchaikovsky. <laughs> and he has those, and he, yeah, there's a little ratchet underneath it goes... Tick, 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 and it really sounds like these two... Uh, mechanisms are going on above. He, in all of his music, actually, this connection between sound, uh, sometimes sort of percussive sound, a mechanical sound even, 
um, and the notes is incredibly tied together. I mean, we, we, there's lots of other composers where if someone makes the physical sound of something mechanical, we talk about it and it's the big thing. Ollie does it all over the place and it's so connected to the music that you, you almost don't notice that there's something extra musical going on. For instance, that moment with the ratchet or uh, the hums and songs of Winnie the Pooh begins with uh, two claves going tick, 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 and it's wonderful and it sort of sets up this mechanism. Then there's, of course, more serious pieces, and it's fascinating to look at the authors that Ollie set. So the operas are Maurice Sendak, we have A.A. A. Milne, uh, we have Whitman, Emily Dickinson, we have Auden, but then there's also Trackel, Rilke, uh, Antonio Machado, the Spanish poet, um, Machado, Auden, Dickinson and Rilke are actually all part of this extraordinary piece, Requiem for Sue, written for Ollie's late wife after she died. Um, and in that, he, he, each movement is almost a different type of music, but all connected with uh, little sets of notes and ideas and ensemble sound. It's a very mellow, dark sounding ensemble. Um, but he did something amazing, which he then later did in his last piece, O Hototu Gizu, with the text. So he, um, he knew he wanted to say something about his wife, whose name was Sue, but he couldn't find the right poem to do it. But he realized that Emily Dickinson's sister was called Sue. And so there's a whole bunch of Emily Dickinson poems which talk about Sue. And he sort of took lines from the whole different bunch of Emily Dickinson poems, collaged them together to create a sort of Emily Dickinson Nussen melange. And he did the same in his last piece with Japanese haiku. Oho Totugizu is about this bird, this type of cuckoo. And he took all of these Japanese haiku and didn't necessarily use all of them or all lines from all of them, but sort of collaged his own together, uh, which I think is an extraordinary way of working with text. And instrumentally, so he wrote, of course, operas for orchestra, for ensembles, for quite varied setups of ensembles. Absolutely. Solo voice pieces, uh, two concertos. There's a horn concerto, uh, which uses the horn and the gestures of the horn in all of its romantic glory. Each gesture from that, even though it's very modern, note-wise and structurally, is a sort of out of a Strauss piece or out of a Liszt piece or uh, out of a Wagner opera, it's extraordinary. The violin concerto written for uh, Pinterest Zuckerman, um, where the violin plays this, um, Ollie talked about the violin being like a tightrope walker. Actually, it was written at the, just after 9-11, and between the first and the last chord, he sort of imagined the two twin towers and a tightrope walker as the violin running between, or uh, going between these two. Um, extraordinary piece, um, very sort of neoclassical in its sort of form. It's got an aria and a recitative, but incredibly personal and tender. There's a there's a big side to Ollie's music which I adore, which is of tenderness. He was sort of anti bombast, although there are moments in wild things like the wild rumpus where. It's quite bombastic, but really he shied away from, from that. And almost all his pieces, there's these incredible moments of tenderness. One of my favorites is the very ending of Wild Things, where Max, the protagonist, asks whether his mum's left him some soup. And it's, did she make it hot? It's hot. And the, the, the rhythm, the lightness, and the notes, just, they're sort of heart-wrenchingly tender. And I think Ollie, Ollie often talked about Stravinsky's tenderness. Most people talk about Stravinsky's bombast, Rite of Spring, Petrushka. Or his hardness. Or his hardness. Accents yeah, yeah, neoclassicism. And... But things like uh, Orpheus or bits of Jeu de Carte uh, or the Octet are incredibly gentle and tender. Um, Ollie's favorite bit, for instance, of the Firebird was the, the little round in the middle, da dee 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 which is, again is just so gentle and tender. Um, and I think that's something that 
I love in music a lot is, is the tenderness. For those who don't know his music, it's, it's often on a smaller scale, time-wise, but in any moment there's so much depth, so much going on. Um, it's very jewel-like music, it sparkles, it's incredibly constructed and put together very intelligently, but so sort of um, subjective and emotional within that. A lot of that he learned from Ravel, Stravinsky, who were two of his big uh, highlights, but Respighi as well. I mean, he talks about the Fountains of Rome as being a very early piece that he just connected with. And the orchestration and the way that Respighi makes orchestras sound. Uh, I remember talking to him about the uh, Tritico Botticelliano as well, which he found the first movement really quite hilarious. It's, um, it, it takes La Primavera of Botticelli and uh, makes this sort of faux Vivaldi underneath it. Incredibly kitsch, so kitsch. But the last movement, which is uh, the Venus coming out of the the shell is this extraordinary sort of representation of the birth of Venus, of her coming out of the waves in the shell. And is just perfect. And Ollie adored it. And you can sort of see that, um, that glistening of Respighi and the orchestration in his music. But likewise, there's pieces which go back to the, to the 16th century. Um, there's these pieces, uh, Music for a Puppet Court, where he takes these puzzle cannons, which are a bit like crosswords, um, where there's, there's a few lines, but then one of the lines is missing, and there's a clue. And they were actually all completed in the 1950s, and Ollie used these, and he loved the, the game of it. Um, yeah. It's very diverse, his music, as you describe it, but in a certain way, there's also an underlying connection, right? There's a style which is recognizable as his. What, what is that connection? <sighs> I, I don't think I can describe it, um, but you hear any, pretty much any moment, and it's suddenly Ollie's. Um, I mean, if we go to the piece, that, the last piece of his that we performed together, that was Processionals. Yeah. Um, very much a piece that has a, a very specific and brilliant orchestration of the instruments. Um, perhaps it's the, I don't know, perhaps it's this this maybe integration of all this musical history also with a brilliant ear for for sound or something. his ear was extraordinary absolutely i think there's a few there's a few traits you can talk about so in processionals you um one of the things is that there's always a fabulous fundament uh, by that i mean the sort of the lowest note um ollie learned a lot of music sitting in front of his dad's double bass in the lso his father was chairman of the lso and Ollie from, well, probably from about one or two, sat in the LSO in front of the double basses. So for him, that grounding of harmony is super important. It's also actually why he never wrote a string quartet, because for him, he missed that extra octave underneath. So I think always sort of uh, harmony and functional harmony, even if it's not diatonic, so even if it's not, you know, tonic and dominant, it's always... Uh, functional meaning that it's got direction, it's got gravity. I think another thing is his horn writing, which again comes back from his LSO days. It's that he heard the horns in the LSO and his horn writing, however modern or modernist it is, whatever the, the notes are, is still classic horn gestures. And in processionals, you'll hear some stunning, uh, you know, horn leaps and horn lines. Mm -hmm. 
think his way of accentuating important moments and making them very clear for listeners is really amazing. Often with percussion, uh, so you'll get a line, and in processionals this happens quite a lot, you'll get a line and there's some complexity and things moving in different directions. And then at one moment things come together and it's sort of exemplified by a, a ting or a pit or a bloop from someone. And whilst it's a very simple thing when you talk about it, actually when you hear his music, it's the surface of it is so easy to follow. And I, that's why I think his music is so extraordinary because really anyone I play it to loves it. Because the, the surface is beautiful and very accessible because he's very clear about where he's going. Then, of course, there's lots of different layers underneath, which, depending on who you are, what you know, what your experience with music is, you can hear or not hear. And they only add to, to the experience. Yeah, so it at least gives it a great depth, no matter how sparkling the... The surfaces. Well, well, this depth is something Ollie loved, and for him, that's that's where the details come in. So he, um, for for instance, his love of art. Um, he loved a, a Flemish um, painter called Patineer, who makes these. You know, they're not very big paintings, and there's, uh, you know, it's it's old school Flemish art. There's always a, a Virgin Mary or a, someone on a horse or something, and then these this sort of landscape behind. But the more you look at the landscape, you realize every corner of it has a story. So, you know, you're here and there's a hill, and on the hill there's some trees. Under the trees, there's some peasants having a little party. And they're miniature, but each one tells a story. Um, another one, uh, another artist he loved was the English mad, genuinely mad artist, Richard Dadd. Um, and he used um, one of these... Uh, pictures as a model for his Flourish with Fireworks. And again, these pictures are so condensed and in every little corner, there's multiple things going on. So there's a, Ollie talked about, um, there's a, a gentleman with a big beard and he wears this hat and the, the brim of the hat somehow extends to form a line. And on this line, is Queen Mab and her whole entourage, you know, about that big. And that's in Ollie's music as well. Wherever you look, there's a, a beautiful, understandable, accessible, shiny surface, mostly shiny surface. And underneath there is this incredible attention to detail. There's a famous spot that he talked about a lot, which is in his opera, Where the World Things Are, there's a sea journey and you get a beautiful legato horn solo and underneath from harp, piano and occasionally percussion you get bludum, bludum. And he spent weeks, literally weeks, even though the piece was late and rehearsals were starting, getting each of those bludums uh, perfect. So each one tells a story, each one is different and between three, four, you could just play those and it would be a piece of music in and of itself. And for me, that's like looking at the Patine painting and in the distance, there's still a beautiful story wonderfully constructed. Yeah, and I guess that's maybe also why he was known, especially in, in the last decades in musical circles as a composer who was often slow in writing and late uh, in delivering his work. I remember when I was a student, when I was having master classes with Pinker Zuckerman, he to to <laughs> told us how he, would, he was on tour and he received one page a, a day of his violin, violin concerto, concerto yeah. uh, by fax, you know, <laughs> and then he was kind of practicing and then at the end of this tour he would have to premiere it. Yeah, I, Oli struggled with deadlines, um, I think which came from a number of reasons. Firstly, he was a very active conductor and he didn't have as much time for composition as he would have loved. Um, also, he, by the time I knew him, I think earlier in his life he sketched uh, gratuitously, like so much sketching. By the time I knew him, he really composed in his head. And he worked things out, again, with this amazing ear, this amazing inner ear, and this amazing memory. He could work things out, and almost he would then just write the piece 
as it was. Um, but all of the sketchings and workings out would go on in his head, and that's fine. Um, but I think that that makes it even harder than if you get a bit stuck, because you know some of the the things which he used to talk about, and he knew like you, you always leave a, a few bars at the end of the day which you know how they're going to go. So when you come in next morning, you start with those few bars, and it's like warming up. Um, but I think when you're doing things really in your head, that becomes really hard and I don't think he ever stopped composing there was never a moment where he wasn't thinking about his music and his imagination so art played a very big role in Ollie's life and in his personality but can you tell us more about about Ollie the man as a person, as a personality, what kind of character was he, what, what typified him? Well, he had this wonderful humor, incredible humor. He loved um, things like Curb Your Enthusiasm and Peter Sellers, and we'd spend hours watching comic movies or listening to old radio shows. He was also one of the most generous people I've ever met with his time, uh, with his knowledge. He just loved to to offer people things about himself and so about he really music. loved uh, kind of uh, passing on what he had yeah. to the new generation of conductors and composers and absolutely it wasn't exactly teaching or teaching in a normal sense because i mean i very rarely conducted in front of him and he'd say do it like this or whatever we'd learn scores together we'd talk about how to get around corners um, but he would constantly talk about music. Um, I remember a meal we had on tour. He'd had a whole day of rehearsing. We went out for a meal with very nice wine and a very nice steak. And for about an hour and a half, he took me through all Strauss tone poems, pretty much bar by bar or section by section, talking about the section, how it functioned, how it worked. And then also talking about the weaker sections as he saw them. And uh, I, you know, I remember him talking about the opening of Heldenleben being the best opening of any piece ever. And it is, it's this extraordinary tune and outpouring. Um, and then he gets onto the second section again where Strauss becomes a bit more sort of autobiographic. And he goes, and there's problems here and there's problems here. And that was extraordinary. We, took, we went through everyone. I mean, even pieces like Macbeth, which nobody knows. Ollie knew, and he knew enough to sit around a table and just lecture on them. And he was really a mentor, I think, in the best sense, more almost oh, a completely. father, I guess, you know? Definitely, um, which actually then made his passing for me very, very, very difficult. Um, um, but he was extraordinary with the information and time that he'd give me. I'd often call him up. We'd speak on the phone a lot. He loved to talk on the phone, so when I wasn't seeing him, we'd talk on the phone and I'd tell him what I was doing, how my rehearsal had gone that day, what had gone wrong, and he'd go, oh, well, I bet you did this, or have you thought of doing that, or, oh, yes, yeah, subdivide there, or, you know, or tell the viola player to. <laughs> <laughs> so you had the opportunity of working with Ollie at the composition classes, workshops he did at Albra. What was your sense of what he was like as a composition teacher? Well, I think the, the biggest thing about him as a composition teacher is that he dealt in details in craftsmanship. That again, there was, he, not that he wasn't interested in big concepts, but he would never change a composer's language or change what the piece wanted to do. He was incredibly fast at reading through a piece and understanding what it was trying to do and then looking at ways of drawing that out of it. Often tiny ways of just reorchestrating or adding a little bit here or taking a little bit away of, it was always, it's very hard to generalize because it was always so connected to what he had in front of him. The, the sessions we had with Ensemble was fascinating because he would just, again, play through things. He wanted composers to hear things, so we'd they were wonderful courses. People, the composers would write something overnight. I'd get an hour to learn it before the rehearsal in the morning, and then we'd 
play through what they'd done. And almost always, Ollie would say, OK, just play through it again. Giving the players a chance to get used to it, me a chance to get used to it, him a chance to hear it again. But mostly the composer just time with the actual instruments in a hall. And I think the composers that he worked with just learnt so much from him. And there's so many composers that he supported that he then took on after these courses and performed their music and helped them. And I mean, all the way back to Mark Anthony Turnage, who again we've done here together, um, Julian Anderson, uh, Tom Addis, through to Charlotte Bray, Helen Grime, Oscar Betterson, uh, Frere Whaley Cohen, who was his sort of final student some way. And Ollie not only taught them at a table in front of an ensemble, but he would then support them and perform their music and perform it multiple times. It wasn't just a, I'll do a premiere. It was often he'd do the second performance and third performance and invite these people into rehearsals and talk to them and treat them with so much respect and so well. And interestingly, from those composers you named who worked with Ollie, who he mentored, they're, they're extremely different. They all have their own style. They have extremely contrasting ways of dealing with musical material. So then I guess it comes back to what you're saying, that he must have really given them a lot when it comes to the, the detail of how do you orchestrate, how do you get your idea out, and how do you deal with notation in a way which is functional for a conductor and a musician. Right? I think Ollie lo he would have loved to be seen as a craftsman. Uh, you know, he talks about the fact that when someone makes a chair or makes a table, even if it's a beautiful, ornate, perfectly balanced one, no one questions why they do that. They go, oh, wow, well, what beautiful craftsmanship. And I think for him, he'd love to see the same thing with music. Uh, you know, we often have to ask for uh, all sorts of reasons why we make music, what's the role of music in the world. And for Ollie, those, just music was... It was just there. It was something almost absolute. And he did it because that's what he did. And I think that that way of teaching then, and you look at his students and they all have that sort of, uh, not quite absolutism, but a clarity of craftsmanship. They're beautifully written. I mean, sometimes actually the physical writing, Ollie loved the way scores looked. And his scores are almost all handwritten by him. The operas are a bit of an exception because they were such a huge project. Although it's quite fun if you look through the original handwritten scores of Where the World Things Are and Higgledy Piggledy Pop, that you can see who was copying out. And it was all of the top composers of the day were doing a scene each. <laughs> Fabulous. But Ollie's scores are beautifully handwritten in this tiny handwriting. And they look perfect. I don't mean they look neat and clean, although they do, but they look like the music that they resemble um, auditarily. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was Oliver Nussen's relationship with the Netherlands. So he spent a lot of time conducting here mm -hmm. with, with the he loved ensembles. It. He loved it in Holland. He loved the musicians. So he, he worked here quite often over his career as a conductor. Also, a, a deal of his music was also performed here mm -hmm. uh, in decades past. Nowadays, much less perhaps than it used to be or deserves to be. Um, what, what was his relationship here with performers and composers and how did he develop that? Well, I don't quite know about the early years because I didn't know him so much. But I, I believe the first real job he got here was he was a, a principal guest or a very regular guest conductor here with the Residency Orchestra in the time of Svetlanov. In The Hague. In The Hague. Yeah. Um, then by the time I knew him, he was conducting regularly with the Asko Schoenberg Ensemble. I saw him uh, with the Concertgebouw as well. And he, he, he not only loved Holland, loved Amsterdam, loved... Uh, the people here, but he had incredible friendships here. Um, I remember dinners post-concert where sort of everyone from Dutch society would 
Dutch Music Society would come and would come and meet him. And, uh, he was very close to Reinbert de Leeuw. Um, a lot of the fabulous players from the Asko Schoenberg, and he'd go to their houses and they'd perform his music and uh, talk and drink wine. Um, and he, of course, wrote the. There's a, a piece called Tu Organa, of which the second one was written for the. 25th anniversary, I believe, of the Asko Schoenberg. And in it, he has this little cipher. So he takes n note names from the letters of Reinbert de Leeuw's name and Schoenberg, or Asko Schoenberg. And he sort of weaves them into this incredibly contrapuntal um, piece, in some ways based off uh, French music from the late Renaissance, you know, Leonard and Parenta. And the first Organa is was made for a toy box. Again, he loves toys, um, and so Ollie did quite a lot of Dutch music as well. I, one of my favourite, amazing experiences was conducting Reinbert's huge piece, uh, the Nachtlichter Wanderer, with Ollie. It needs two conductors, and we did it in London at the Palms, and we had a week, an extraordinary week, with Ollie and Reinbert performing this music. Um, I, I learned a huge amount and I just sort of sat and I remember Ollie at these dinners that we used to go to, Ollie used to tease me because I didn't say very much. I'd be like, well, why would I say anything? You know, you have <laughs> Reinbert, George Benjamin, Julian Anderson, uh, all sitting around a table, old players from Concert Cabal, uh, players who have worked with you for 25, 30 years. I'm just going to listen and, and take things in. So Ali was somebody who also admired previous generations of conductors. Yes. So he saw himself as part of a historical tradition, or how did he view himself within that history of conducting? Well, his, his conducting was extraordinary. He, he had this incredibly uh, small beat. There was a lot of point or click to it. Um, and he would also often subdivide within a beat. So if a bar's in 4-4, four, four, you go 1 two, three, four. He would help players by doing one and two and three, or maybe a triplet, one, ding, 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 gong, ding, and it's very light. And he could trace that tradition back to someone like Bruno Walter, uh, through Stokowski, who he adored. I was lucky enough to do a few concerts with Oli as the second conductor, some Charles Ives, the Weinberg de Leu, um, and that was absolutely fascinating because the way his click connected to the beat was something very, very special. And you can hear it in his recordings, is that there's this constant movement. Everything moves forwards. There's always line, even if something slows down. Um, for me, what I learned, because so in both the Ives and the Rheinbeck Leo, I have to conduct at cross purposes, so in different time signatures to Ollie. And if I conducted the right tempo, then I'd always end up fractionally behind Ollie. That what you had to do was just almost like scoop each beat and move it forward. So he was constantly just on the forefront of every beat. So it was still exactly the metronome mark, but just moving forwards. And I think that this, um, this ability with tempo came very early on. He talks about watching gramophone records and about learning about time from gramophone records. So he knew that one side of a disc was four minutes or six minutes or whatever. And he developed real absolute time. And I think this is fascinating when it comes to his tempo markings as well, because a lot of composers write tempo markings, you know, metronome markings. So quadrat equals 120. And for some of them, it's the right speed. For some of them, it's not quite the right speed. Um, but for Ollie, it was less about the speed at which something went, but more about the length of time it took for that section to, to sound. And this sounds maybe a little bit theoretical for some people, but he really knew what 32 seconds was, or 16 seconds, or a minute and 52. And he knew he could really tell when it was a minute and 54. Um, he had a wonderful um, toy which we used to play with together, which was a stopwatch, um, and you sort of tapped it, and it would tell you how many beats per minute. 
And so he'd challenge me, he'd go like, 120, dick, 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 122, no. And then he'd do it, 120, or <laughs> 96, or whatever. Um, and just uh, on a personal side, I use his music still to pick tempos. So for me, 120 or 60 is, and as he sat, he sang this lit. Or 113 is higgledy piggledy pop. And I, when I'm sort of having to pick tempos out of thin air, I have little bits of Ollie's music going around my head. And we used to sit and watch endless videos of old conductors, of Charles Munch, of Fitz Reiner, of Lovo von Matichik, who he was an extraordinary conductor, very unknown these days. Um, and Ollie had this sort of incredible understanding of their techniques, and he would talk about it just sort of lying on his sofa, and I always sat in the chair. And he'd sort of just make comments, and they were, they were gemstones of con comments. Uh, he talked actually about his father teaching him to conduct. I think his father had really wanted Ollie to be a conductor. And for Ollie, his sort of rebellion, or one of his rebellions, was n being a composer, uh, not so much being a conductor, although he, of course, then did conduct and conducted incredibly. Um, but he remembers his father training him and holding his hands out, and Ollie had to beat within his hands, which is an old sort of Viennese, classic Viennese technique. And everything's here, and there's a frame, you're in it, you connect with your eyes. He, so much of what he did was through his eyes, and he talked to me a lot about that, and um, about when to look at people, when not to look at people, when to, he had this wonderful wry smile. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's that old classic thing of when someone makes a mistake, you leave it. When someone makes a mistake a second time, you look at them. When someone makes a mistake a third time, you look at them and smile. And when they make it a fourth time, you fix it. <laughs> Which, yeah, it's a bit like Strauss talking about never look at the trombones, otherwise they'll play too loud. There's a big grain of truth in that, and uh, I use that to this day that, I remember as a student, you know, you'd conduct one bar and stop and fix everything. And, tip, and it's lovely, and, you know, as a student, that's a great thing to do, but... It's the pitfall of many a young conductor to try and control and fix every single detail. Of the... Absolutely, but just playing through and playing through and playing through, and, you know, musicians are really, really, really good in orchestras, and they fix things, and then you can help them, and then then the, the rehearsal is incredibly economic. Ollie was an amazing... So is that what his rehearsals were like? He would do a lot of just... A lot of playing through, a lot of taking things out of context, or so a few voices here, a few voices there. So, so to actually give the musicians a chance to hear the connections between voices. And he'd often, you know, very simple, louder, softer, earlier, later, shorter rests. Oh, by the way, seconds and clarinets, you are supposed to connect on the seventh semiquaver there. Just giving people information. Um, there's one of his favorite videos of, was of Stokowski rehearsing uh, Rachmaninoff Paganini variations. I think it's still available on YouTube. And he plays through a variation and he says one thing, often about articulation, plays through it again and the sound has completely changed. Every time it's like a different orchestra the second time round. And Ollie loved this and we watched it many times. <laughs> so Oliver was a, Ollie, I should call him, was really an all-round conductor. Many people know him as a composer and a contemporary music specialist. But he, he knew a lot of repertoire, all the repertoire. Oh my God, a... his knowledge of repertoire was, was second to none, I think. I mean... People know him for the contemporary music, and he was hugely supportive of contemporary music. But he, well, one of the things about him was he had this extraordinary memory. He never forgot anything, which was amazing. It also caused him some, some difficulties because traumas from his life he remembered like they were yesterday. But musically, it meant that almost any piece he'd ever heard, he remembered perfectly. And he had such a love for for so much music. I mean, I remember sitting around the table and looking at all editions of Bruckner's symphonies with him, working through and then looking at the completions of different things and who'd done what. Uh, he'd 
loved Mahler, he loved Bruckner, he loved Schubert, Schumann. I uh, had an extraordinary time with him in listening through to Lenny Bernstein conducting Schumann symphonies and him talking through what Bernstein was doing. He'd known Bernstein and describing, describing those performances as this is how a composer conducts Schumann. It's like at every point that there was a decision to be made, he felt that Bernstein responded to that decision as though he was writing the piece. So all the moments became functional. You know, they move you forwards, they pull you back, they guide you um, this way or that way through the, through the notes of the music. Not, Ollie was sort of, he hated this idea of concept, of sort of one big idea placed onto a piece or a genre. Um, he, he was a, a details man. Just m continuing that line, yeah. of, line of thought, what, um, what, did he, what did he share with you or what do you take away from him about his approach to these historical masterworks? Well, for him, it's, it's what, it was one tradition, one line, not necessarily a linear line. He loved things that didn't necessarily fit into our sort of understanding of music history as one history. So uh, he loved Busoni, for instance, who's very rarely performed now because he didn't, in some ways, he's a bit of a dead end. He didn't sort of lead anywhere in the way that Schoenberg did, although Ollie loved Schoenberg as well. Um, and I suppose, I mean, I'm just recording Franz Schmidt symphonies, which are totally within that vein. Schmidt is off as a little, a little siding beautiful music, um, but it doesn't necessarily lead somewhere in the way that our, our narrative does. And Ollie had this sort of encyclopedic knowledge of very early music to absolutely on point modern music. And you hear that in his music. This craftsmanship that, that Ollie represented, how was that also symbolized or represented in his conducting, his way of conducting? Well, he, firstly, he, he conducted pieces that he thought were very well crafted, uh, from Tchaikovsky to Elliot Carter uh, to Mozart. Um, he treated every note, I mean, if not equally, of equal importance. There were never any shortcuts. There were never any, um, you know, make the surface interesting and don't worry about the rest. It was always um, highlighting the full score of everything that was there and taking every note, every marking, every manuscript, every correction, every letter into account. Uh, and we, I mean, that's something we really connected on because I'm a complete nerd. And I love looking at old manuscripts and uh, handwritten things. And, uh, we were lucky we went to the Library of Congress together and saw some extraordinary scores. Um, he got out Schoenberg's serenade, all of the original manuscripts, uh, the survivor from Warsaw, uh, w which I hadn't realized. So it's written at the end of Schoenberg's life and Schoenberg's eyesight was going. So it's written on these staves that are big and like these big note heads like this amazing in that piece as well. Uh, I looked at Pierre Lunaire, which of course Ollie had recorded. I was performing it at the time and the manuscript answered so many questions actually. Practical ones, not, again, you know, Ollie, not that he wasn't spiritual, but he had no conversation about spirituality or, oh wow, I have the composer's manuscript in my hand. It was like, ah, that's why that tempo marking is there because there's a line change and it's repeated. So that's why when you see it in a, a printed score, you get two bars with the same tempo marking. And it's like, ah, oh, that answers a very practical question. He was so pragmatic, so practical. And his music is all practical. I mean, when we were playing uh, processionals, it's hard. It's, you know, there's a lot of detail and particularly the verticality of getting a lot of it together is difficult but it's totally practical and he understood instruments, ensembles, orchestras. And when you hear his music, it often needs a lot of work, 
but it just plays and it just sort of sings. <laughs> 